Number five on this list is Happy Science. Kind of a fun name that they have there for sure, but maybe not the funnest of cults. Ranker says, if you're looking for a mashup of world religions, new age, hokum, far-right nationalism, and infrastructure spending, then Japanese cult Happy Science is for you. It was founded in 1986 by Ryoho Okawa, a former salaryman who was enraptured by a group called the God Light Association. He soon formed his own cult of personality called Science of Happiness and changed its name to Happy Science a few years later. Okawa believes he is the human incarnation of a supreme being called El Kenter who combines Christ Buddha, Muhammad, and every other prophetic deity to create a nine-dimensional heaven with him at the head. He's also created a massively complex mythology of New Age nonsense while simultaneously founding a political wing called the Happiness Realization Party. Here's where the strangeness goes into overdrive though. As his party advocates a vicious Japanese nationalism devoted to denying historical cruelties, advocating conflict with China and North Korea and rebuilding Japan's infrastructure. The group claims to have 12 million members around the world, has a multimedia arm, and enjoys tax-exempt status in the US. So basically, if it was up to this group, Japan would be invading China and North Korea and probably well on its way to starting World War III. So yeah, definitely not one that you want to be a part of because that could obviously get very bad very quickly. Not to mention you need to worship this dude who believes that he's the human incarnation of all these cool people. I mean, if he actually is the human reincarnation of all of those people, then that's freaking awesome, but... Come on guys, I think the likelihood that this dude is Jesus as well as Buddha is pretty low. Number four on this list is the Brethren. Yeah, so joining this cult really would just be the worst, guys. You just need to give up so much to do it. Ranker says, also known as Body of Christ and Garbage Eaters, the Brethren are an apocalyptic offshoot of the 70s Jesus movement, eschewing worldly possessions and earthly pleasures to purify themselves for the coming end of the world. Brethren members essentially live as vagrants doing odd jobs to survive, eating trash, avoiding bathing and medical treatment, and giving whatever money they do make to the group. They also forbid dancing and laughing until the return of Jesus, bar members from communicating with family, and forbid contact between binary genders. Group founder Jim Roberts passed in December 2015, leaving the future of the secretive cult unclear. You literally need to give up everything in your entire life to get ready for when Jesus returns. I just don't get this one, guys. Like, maybe it's because I'm not part of this cult, but I guess it isn't clear to me why Jesus would be angry that you have earthly possessions. Like, what does he have against you having the occasional knickknack, you know? Also, there's the whole thing where you literally need to eat garbage. I don't think that they're joking about that, guys. Like, you will be eating scraps if you join this cult. Never having a warm meal again, that's about as terrifying as it can get. Number three on this list is the Fundamentalist Church Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You guys might be familiar with this one right now as it's currently very popular. Netflix just released a documentary about this cult, so if you want a more in-depth summary of what went down, definitely go check that out. Ranker says that this cult was an offshoot of Mormonism that's constantly in the news for unsavory reasons. FLDS openly embraces polygamy, which the mainstream LDS outlawed a century ago. The group has anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 members in rural Utah and Arizona, with the group having almost total control of two small, linked border towns in two states. While Mormon splinter groups had been around long before, the FLDS was incorporated in 1991 by a group of men who had been excommunicated by the church. They went through a range of leaders who all declared themselves prophets until being taken over by Rulon Jeffs in 2002. He passed shortly thereafter and his son Warren took over. It was under Warren Jeffs that the FLDS practices of child marriage, bigamy, Access, racism, abandonment of teenage boys all became public knowledge. Jeffs was sent to prison in 2007 but continues to be the de facto head of the church while his successors squabble for power. This cult certainly isn't as powerful as it once was and you have to imagine that as time goes on and more people are educated on what this cult did in the past, that will continue on a downward trajectory. But for now, they still aren't totally finished and if you wanted to, then you could join this group. Absolutely do not 
not do that though because these people get up to some very weird and often illegal things. Like the leader was literally sent to jail and is still there rotting away. I would not want to get myself into a situation where I'm anywhere close to the people that support that guy. Number two on this list is the new Wabian Nation. This one is absolutely nuts, guys, so strap in. Ranker says, formerly known as the United New Wabian Nation of Moors, this is a cult of personality based around founder Dwight York. Combining Christianity, ancient Egyptian iconography, African rituals, and a belief that aliens are coming, the nation believes that 144,000 chosen people will be taken away in a flying city, spirited to Orion, to prepare for the final fight against Satan. Shockingly, York's mishmash of New Age concepts, black power militancy, and ancient Egyptian religion caught on in both the hip-hop community and in rural Georgia, where York built a massive compound made with donated funds. York's mythology grew incorporating cloning, racial theory, cosmology, anti-government conspiracies, and linguistics. Even as the cult grew, York was under investigation, and he was finally detained in 2002 for running a massive human trafficking ring comprising as many as 1,000 individuals. He was sent to prison for life and his compound was seized and demolished. The group still exists, though in much smaller numbers. If we just ignore all of the human rights violations for a second, which we shouldn't by the way, but let's just do it anyways for one moment, then at the best possible case scenario, you join this cult and then dedicate your life preparing for a battle with Satan that you may not ever have have because not only is that crazy, but you might not even be in the 140,000 people who gets picked to have said battle with Satan. Like this just doesn't make any sense at all, guys. Then we add back on all of those human rights violations and all the other stuff that York was sent to jail for and you get one sick and twisted cocktail that is this cult. Number one on this list is Church Universal and Triumphant. Yet another cult of personality in New Age clothes, the CUT was founded in 1970 as an offshoot of a different movement, Summit Lighthouse. Founder Elizabeth Clare Prophet pitched herself and her husband as messengers of the Ascended Masters, a set of spiritually awakened ancient beings central to the Theosophy belief system. They also threw in elements of Christian science, the, the I Am movement, and Mormon-style doomsday prepping. The Prophets grew wealthy enough to buy large spreads in the Santa Monica Mountains and Montana, while members drove themselves into debt building fallout shelters and paying huge sums of money to reserve a spot in the post-nuclear conflict society. The church was also accused of making illicit straw purchases and of using sleep deprivation against members who attempted to leave. In ill health, the prophet retired in 1999 and passed 10 years later. Since then, the church has gone through legal problems and succession squabbles, but members still meet on a regular basis. So yeah, just join this cult if you want to potentially get tortured from sleep deprivation. Oh, and while we're torturing you, we're also going to take all your money and invest it into some underground bunker that you'll probably never use. If that doesn't sound like an excellent use of time and money to you, which it probably shouldn't, then I really wouldn't recommend joining this cult. In fifth place, we have Nixium. I thought I'd kick off today with the most recent cult on our list. Nixium was started in 1998, making it younger than I am. Founder Keith Rainier originally promoted Nixium as a self-help organization with workshops and classes on empowerment. Nixium amassed more than 18,000 followers across North America until 2017, when members came forward to expose the not-so-good practices of a secret society within the group. Women were recruited under the false pretense that they were joining a sisterhood of sorts, but it ended up being a sex cult. So a pyramid scheme existed within the group, with Keith, who members called Vanguard at the top, followed by Masters, who recruited other women to the secretive group, and at the bottom were the newest recruits, who were referred to as slaves. A former member explained that in order to be admitted to the secret club, she had to give her master naked photos and other compromising documents that would be used as blackmail if she ever told anyone about the group's existence. She was also told that another part of the initiation process was getting a small tattoo, but when the day of the marking arrived, instead of a tattoo, the new members were told to undress and their master branded them with a design that included Keith's initials right above their pelvic area. Each woman was instructed to say, and I quote, Master, please brand me, it would be an honor. 
Ugh, icky. Just so icky. In 2020, Keith was tried in court, where more than a dozen women came forward with statements regarding his psychological and sexual misdoings. He was convicted of many crimes, including um, sex, vroom vroom, <laughs> racketeering, and underage bad videos. Keith was sentenced to life in prison, but in a court filing, his lawyers wrote that he is not sorry for his conduct or his choices. Well, that just kind of knocks the wind out of me. Anyone else? In fourth place, we have the Children of God. Initially called Teens for Christ, Children of God, or COG, was found founded in 1968 by rogue preacher David Berg in Huntington Beach, California. Attracting young runaways and hippies, David preached a kind of worship that combined the ways of Jesus Christ with the free love movement of the 1960s. Group living, um, zealous converting, and isolated communes were all pillars of the Children of God Church. Members who got to be around 15,000 people across the world at its peak didn't work or go to school. The COG didn't believe in the um, nuclear family, so younglings were grouped together and lived separately from their parents. In the late 1970s, COG became notorious for the sexual practices that one of the founders' own daughters later described as um, religious sexual coercion. David coined the term flirty fishing, which was a sexual practice in which women would allegedly have sex with men to bring them into the cult. If that wasn't scummy enough, he also promoted and encouraged the sexualization of younglings within the COG community. As David manipulated the COG family with his sadistic practices, members started leaving the community, including the families of actors Joaquin Phoenix and Rose McGowan, who both grew up in the communes. Former COG members began coming forward in the early 1990s, describing an environment that permitted and encouraged the physical and sexual taking advantage of of younglings. Ricky Depoy appeared on a talk show in 1993 and revealed that he'd been ordered by the group to forcibly fornicate with someone barely in the double digits of age. Ricky later took his own life, sadly like many other members of the group, including the founder's son Ricky Rodriguez, who was sexually taken advantage of throughout his life by his father and the group. Although David died in 1994 while under FBI investigation, the cult continues to exist and now goes by the name Family International, although the group claims that the horrific practices are a thing of the past. Sure. Okay. I trust that as much as I trust the construction in Toronto to meet a deadline. No. In third place, we have the People's Temple. In the 1950s, Indiana resident Jim Jones founded a church that he claimed promoted socialism and equality with the religious elements of Christianity. So initially, he was a little more than, you know, just like a charismatic hustler who faked faith healings by having audience plants pull chicken livers out of congregants' mouths. But as the years progressed, he demanded more and more of his followers. In the early 1970s, Jones moved his group to California and set them up in a commune-like settlement in the Redwood Valley. After he established several locations throughout the state, including its headquarters in San Francisco, the temple forged ties with many left-wing political figures and claimed to have 20,000 members, even though apparently three to 5,000 is a little more likely. Jones eventually came to believe that the nuclear war was imminent and moved his followers again to the South American country of Guyana, which he thought would be, you know, outside the potential danger zone. The group lived there for several years as the People's Temple Agricultural Project, but after former members started speaking out against the church, San Francisco Congressman Leo Ryan decided to travel to Jonestown to investigate claims of uh not so good things. During his visit, a number of temple members expressed a desire to leave with him and accompanied Leo to the local airstrip at Port Kitsuma. There they were intercepted by self-styled temple security guards who opened fire on the group, killing uh, the congressman, three journalists, one of the defectors, as well as injuring nine others, including Ryan's aide, Jackie Spear. A few seconds of the incident were captured on video by NBC cameraman Bob Brown, one of the journalists who had their lives ended in the attack. That evening in Jonestown, Jones ordered his congregation to drink a a concoction of cyanide laced grape flavored flavor aid. Oh, uh, right. This is where the phrase drinking the Kool Aid originates. All in all, 918 people died. This includes four that died at the temple headquarters that night in the Guyanese capital of Georgetown. Some members resisted ending their lives and were injected with fatal doses of cyanide, as were those too young to drink the drink, and some others survived by fleeing through the jungle. Until 9 it was the largest loss of American civilian life in history, which sends a chill down my spine to just like think about. Just a teensy little side note by the way, surviving temple members of the mass death in the US announced their fears of being targeted by a hit squad composed of Jonestown survivors. Similarly, in 1979, the Associated Press reported a US congressional aide's claim that there were 120 white brainwashed assassins out from Jonestown awaiting the trigger word to pick up their hit. Temple insider Michael Prokes, who had been ordered to deliver a suitcase which contained temple funds, which were supposed to be transferred 
transferred to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, killed himself in March of 1979, four months after the Jonestown incident. In the days leading up to his death, Michael sent notes to several people, together with a 30 page statement he had written about the temple. He had arranged for a press conference in a Modesto, California motel room, during which he read his statement to the eight reporters who attended, before, you know, excusing himself, entering a restroom, and uh, ending his life. The levels of brainwashing displayed here are just too deep to unpack. In second place, we have the family. Oh sure, because that totally sounds wholesome. Known as one of Australia's most notorious cults, yep, you know, not an American one for once, the family began with Anne Hamilton Byrne, who was a yoga teacher who believed herself to be a reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Oh, right, and unlike all the other listings today, this one was founded, yep, by a woman. She teamed up with parapsychologist Raynor Johnson in the mid-1960s to form what was initially known as the Great White Brotherhood. Uh, Christ, I swear I'm not talking about the um, Triple K group or the, the Yahtzees, I promise. Over the course of several years, Anne adopted 28 offspring by receiving the young as gifts from members, as well as by falsifying papers to convince others to give their spawn up for adoption, all in the hope of creating a master race that would survive the apocalypse she believed to be imminent. While other adults in the group were known as either aunties or uncles, Anne claimed to be the biological mother of all 28 adoptees. She also told the offspring she was, yep, Jesus Christ, and when they didn't live up to her exact standards, they were punished forcibly, starved, or, you know, dosed with LSD. Because, you know, a crazy brain trip is exactly how to make little ones behave. The cult went undetected for years because the adoptees were forced to hide whenever visitors arrived. But in 1987, the group's headquarters was finally raided and all the younglings were removed from the premises. Anne was only ever charged with falsifying birth certificates, and in 2019 she died from dementia at about 98 years old, having never faced consequences for her actions. Part of me, my brain feels like it's about to explode. They had 32 years to nail her, and all she got was falsifying birth certificates? I feel like giving underage folks LSD should have been, you know, the priority of offense charging. In first place, we have Aum Shinrikyo. Founded by Shoko Asahara in 1984, Aum Shinrikyo is a Japanese new religious movement and doomsday cult who first made headlines in the late 80s amid accusations that Asahara was forcing members to donate money to the group and holding them against their will. Oh, pardon me, I'll uh, backtrack for a moment. Although Aum was, you know, from the beginning considered controversial in Japan, it was not initially associated with serious crimes. Aum's public relations activities included publishing comics and animated cartoons that attempted to tie its religious ideas to popular anime and manga themes, including space missions, powerful weapons, world conspiracies, and the quest for ultimate truth. Like many cult leaders, Asahara believed in an imminent doomsday, this time caused by a world war started by the United States. And of course, according to him, only his followers would survive. I feel like a broken record, but don't worry. This wouldn't be in first place if it wasn't worse than, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid, giving underagers LSD, and branding. Okay, well, worse in my opinion. I'll admit, my brain's a little warped these days for a morality scale. In 1991, Aum began using wiretapping to get NTT uniforms and equipment and created a manual for wiretapping. In July of 1993, cult members sprayed large amounts of liquid containing bacillus and thrasis spores from a cooling tower on the roof of Aum Shinrikyo's Tokyo headquarters. However, their plan to cause an anthrax epidemic failed. The attack resulted in a large number of complaints about, you know, bad odors, but no infections. At the end of 1993, the cult started secretly manufacturing the nerve agent Sarin, and later VX. So Om um tested its Sarin on sheep at Banjawarn Station, a remote pastoral property in Western Australia, killing 29 sheep. Both Sarin and VX were then used in several assassinations and attempts over 1994 to 1995. In 1995, the group executed a Sarin gas attack in the Tokyo subway, which caused the deaths of 12 people and injured 50 more. The group says that those who carried out the attacks did so secretly, without being known to other executives and ordinary believers. After that attack, Japanese authorities learned that the group had also been responsible for the death of lawyer Tsutsumi Sakamoto, who was working on a class action lawsuit against Aum Shinrikyo at the time of his death. Oh, uh, almost forgot, the group also killed his wife and uh, descendant. On the 6th of July 2018, after exhausting all appeals, Asahara and six followers on death row were executed as punishment for the 1995 attacks and other crimes. So I'm glad that unlike the last leader I discussed, some justice was actually served in this situation. Six additional followers were executed on the 26th of the same month. At 12.10am on New Year's Day of 2019, at least nine people were injured when a car was deliberately driven into crowds celebrating the New Year on Takashita Street in Tokyo. Local police reported the arrest of Kazuhiro Kusakabe, the suspected driver, who allegedly admitted to intentionally ramming his vehicle into crowds to protest his opposition to the death penalty, specifically in retaliation for, uh, yeah, the execution of the aforementioned Om um, cult members. Number 5. The Bilderberg Meeting. 
Starting us off today, we are going to be talking about the uber secretive Bilderberg meeting. Now this one is a little bit of a cheat because technically it's not really a society, but it refers to an annual gathering that definitely happens without any of us knowing in secrecy and involves a lot of key profile VIPs, so I'd say it qualifies. The first Bilderberg meeting dates all the way back to 1954 and was held at the Hotel de Bilderberg in the Netherlands, which is where the group has taken its name since. Convened by Prince Bernhard, the gathering was a collection of powerful politicians from North America and Europe, designed to foster warmer relations between the two continents among fear of growing anti-American sentiment in Europe. In layman's terms, the Bilderberg meeting is an annual meeting where high-ranking politicians agree to not start World War III just yet. You know, just not, not just yet. They'll, they'll do it eventually, but keep things cool for now. Now because of this, the Bilderberg meeting has quite the guest list. It's a veritable who's who. Bill Clinton, Margaret Thatcher, Angela Merkel, Tony Blair, Henry Kissinger, Pete Davidson, to name a few. Now what happens in these meetings is anyone's guess, as they're wrapped in complete and utter secrecy. The minutes are never released, and journalists are barred from reporting on it at all. In fact, I would not be surprised if this video was the first time you've ever even heard of this. The secrecy definitely paves the way for rumors, with the belief that the Bilderberg meeting is an extension of the Illuminati, with the members being part of the New World Order, conspiring to control the world behind the scenes. Now the official website for the Bilderberg meeting maintains, thanks to the private nature of the meeting, the participants take part as individuals rather than in any official capacity, and hence are not bound by the conventions of their office or by positions, which definitely makes things more sus. We'll get to the bottom of this, I'm sure. But if you're looking for more conspiracies, well, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. We've got loads of things on secret societies, ghosts, ghouls, goblins, aliens, UFOs. If it's freaking you out, we've got a video or two on it, I promise you that. So hit subscribe, please do me a little favor and ring that little bell as well so you don't miss a single one of our videos. But do that at the end of this one, because I got four more secret societies that I'd love to tell you all about. Number 4, The Knights of Pythias. Coming up next is going to be the very mythical sounding Knights of Pythias. Oh, we love when a secret society is an order of knights. Ah, oh, I love when something sounds like that. You know, they sound like I gotta go bring them an ancient crystal. The Knights of Pythias was founded by Justus H. Rathbone, a government employee in Washington, D.C. in 1864, who historically has one of the coolest names I've ever heard. Justus H. Rathbone. My God, that just rolls off the tongue. He felt there was an absolute moral need for an organization that practiced brotherly love. He loved Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, he was all about that. Around the same time, the country was involved in a bit of a punch up, bit of a brother against brother, a bit of a, a civil war, you might call it. So brotherly love was needed. President Lincoln, upon learning of this group, expressed his approval of its mission and values, and the Knights became the first fraternal organization in the states to be chartered through an act of Congress. Now the name is a reference to the Greek legend of Damon and Pythias, the Pythagorean ideal of friendship, which I, I guess means that this secret society in Washington DC is the Knights Knights of Friendship. That's a that, that's adorable. All of its founding members worked for the government, and the Knights' colors are blue, yellow, and red. Blue signifying friendship, yellow charity, and red benevolence. The Knights of Pythias are still operating to this day, and are a partner of the Boy Scouts of America. That's hilarious. The second organization to receive its charter from the U.S. Congress. That's the official hierarchy in America. It's Knights and then Boy Scouts. Those <laughs> now, interestingly, the Knights of Pythias, despite their very, very cool name, may very well be one of the only secret societies no one is writing any conspiracy theories about. And I was looking, I really was, but the people in the tinfoil hats are not interested in the Knights of Pythias. Maybe it's because unlike most other secret groups, the Knights really boldly announce that they're just all about friendship and maybe people suspect they're not hiding anything and maybe they're just totally genuine and all about friendship. That won't do for me. I think the whole friendship thing is a complete angle. I think the Knights of Pythias are doing something subliminal, something. They're hacking the airwaves somehow. We'll look into that. We're gonna get back to this. Number three, the Independent Order of Odd Fellows. Oh, the Independent Order of Odd Fellows. Well, <laughs> finally, a secret society that's right for me. How do I gain entrance to this? Well, while I figure that out, I'll mull over the history with you. It's unknown when the Independent Order of Odd Fellows was founded for sure, but the first reference of it ever written comes in 1812 and references George IV. Before he was named Prince Regent of the United Kingdom, George IV had been a member of the Freemasons for a while. 
time. He wanted a member of his family to come join the Freemasons with him and was hoping that his royal connections and purse strings would be able to bypass the lengthy, complicated initiation process. Unfortunately, no one is given such freedoms to bypass Masonic initiation rights. Come on, you should have known that. So George, bittered by an order that wouldn't have him, splintered off to form a rival club, the Independent Order of Odd Fellows. Love the name. Although the website for the order claims that it was started all the way back in 1066, although there aren't as many sources to cite this. Much like the Knights, their guiding principles are the principles of friendship, love, and truth. And its members strive to live by these principles in their daily lives. The organization is non-political and non-sectarian, welcoming individuals from all walks of life and creeds. Are you also getting a bit disappointed that a lot of secret societies on this list have mainly said that they just do like charity work and like helping out around town and, and getting people the help they deserve? No, come on, where's the secret soldiers? Where's the, <laughs> the lizard people living under the White House? Where I, none of this is showing up yet. The Order of Odd Fellas places an emphasis on community service. Its members engage in various charitable activities. They provide relief to the needy. They assist the sick and disabled. They offer scholarships and educational opportunities. Do you guys not conceal any Martians or any UFOs or anything? You just go around giving homes to the elderly and orphans? Gosh, are, are there any secret societies that are trying to control the world still? <sighs> Now regardless of how the order got its start, the order is strong and still going today. The club has counted several British Prime Ministers among its rank, Winston Churchill and Stanley Baldwin to name a few. Number 2. The Patriotic Order Sons of America Imagine a time when patriotism was at its peak and everyone wanted to celebrate their love for their country in a unique way. How fitting that I'm filming this on the 4th of July. Happy Joey Chestnut Day Americans. Enter the Patriotic Order Sons of America, the POSA. This organization founded in 1840 aimed to promote American values, apple pie, American history, and strengthen the bonds of brotherhood among its members. So it's kind of like the America fan club, you know? Americans love America, by and large, but these guys really loved America. Picnics, parades, all manner of social congregation, so long as that social congregation was about celebrating Uncle Sam's land of the free and home of the brave. Now, I am making it sound like it's a patriotic summer camp. And it kind of is. But it was also about education and the preservation of American culture. They upheld the importance of American history by building historical societies, museums, and libraries to collect and document artifacts and stories from the past. Like a time machine to the days of old. Now like any other secret society, obviously they have to have some rituals and ceremonies. As far as we know, nothing too outright sinister, mostly just initiation rites. If you ask the organization, they'll tell you they're one of the most progressive patriotic institutions in the United States. Now how progressive they actually are, definitely up for a little bit of debate. In the 1890s they were only open for white Americans. Today the order opens its membership to all native born or naturalized American male citizens who believe in their country. So it's not super progressive, but as far as secret societies go, it seems like they're pretty benevolent and do just want to celebrate the country and not rule it in secret. Or maybe they do. I don't know. And number one, the Molly Maguires. In the 1870s, 24 foremen and supervisors in the coal mines of Pennsylvania were assassinated. Now, who was behind the plot? The leading suspect was the secret society, the Molly Maguires. Now, that's a secret society name. The Molly Maguires were an organization of Irish militants who it thought got their names because they frequently used women's clothing as a disguise while carrying out acts. This sounds a lot more like it's just a gang than it does a secret society. I'm pretty sure these guys were the bad guys at Red Dead Redemption 2. Operating primarily in the mid 1860s to 1870s, the group was named after a legendary folktale of Molly Maguire, an Irish nun who was evicted from her home. As such, the Maguires acted as a sort of big brother for Irish immigrants in America, aiming to address harsh working conditions and mistreatment by whatever means necessary. Faced with low wages, long hours, and unsafe working conditions, the Maguires sought to protect the rights and interests of their family through resistance resistance, sabotage, and violence. The organization operated covertly, with members swearing oaths of loyalty and secrecy. Their tactics included coercion, intimidation, and you better believe just a little bit of political assassination. They targeted mine operators, foremen, and individuals they perceived as oppressors within the mining industry. Bob 
hunts, murders, all of this stuff pretty commonplace. The rise of the Molly Maguires attracted attention from mining companies and the government. The notorious Pinkerton Detective Agency, the actual bad guys from Red Dead Redemption 2, was hired to infiltrate and gather evidence against the group. High profile trials followed, resulting in the conviction and execution of several Molly Maguires. The trials were marked by controversy and allegations of false testimony, leading to debates about the fairness of the proceedings. But if you know anything about the Pinkertons, said they don't really play fair. Today, the Molly Maguires are still sort of a subject of historical interest, serving as a reminder of the complex dynamics between labor, management, and immigrant communities in the United States during the 19th century. I don't really have a joke to end that on. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think that far ahead. Number five, the Manson family. Starting out with the most famous of the cults on this list, we have the group of young people who fell under the spell of Charles Manson in the late 1960s in California, USA. Charles Manson was in and out of prison for most of his life before settling in San Francisco and beginning to establish himself as a guru during the height of the Summer of Love hippie culture. Using some elements from the philosophy of the Process Church of Final Judgment, who believed that at the end of the world, Jesus and Satan would join forces to judge humanity, Manson formed a group of mostly young women, teaching them that they were reincarnations of the original Christians and that he was Jesus Christ. In a converted school bus, the group made their way to Los Angeles, where Manson preached and continued to grow his group of followers. They stayed in the home of Dennis Wilson, of the Beach Boys for a time, before eventually moving them to an old disused western movie set, Spawn Ranch. In exchange for the company of the many female followers, the owner of the ranch, George Spawn, allowed Manson and his growing family to stay at the ranch free of charge. Manson began using his followers for extortion, taking a music teacher who they believed had inherited a large fortune hostage in his home and demanding that he join the cult and turn over the money. The man maintained that they were mistaken, and Manson attacked him with a sword before having one of his followers finish the job. In the cult's most famous incident, Manson sent four family members to the home of Hollywood actress Sharon Tate with instructions for them to end the lives of Tate and her four guests who were staying with her. The next night, these family members were joined by three others and brought by Manson to the home of Leno and Rosemary LaBianca, where they broke in and tied up the two residents at Manson's instructions. He then ordered them to dispatch the victims and left. Although it hasn't been conclusively proven, the Manson family are believed to be responsible for at least 15 other people, with Manson himself claiming at one point that he was responsible for 35 total deaths. Manson was apprehended and put on trial along with the family members who had carried out his orders, but the trial showed just what a hold Manson still had over his family. Family members showed up outside the courthouse where they held a vigil while armed with hunting knives. They threatened witnesses, setting fire to one man's van while he was still inside it. The trial itself was also a wild time, with one of the defense attorneys who Manson disagreed with going missing and being discovered murdered, and Manson at one point leaping over a table to try and attack the judge while the other defendants began chanting in Latin. Manson and the murderous family members were sent to prison in 1971. Manson remained in prison until his death in 2017. Number 4. Om Shinrikyo this Japanese doomsday cult started out as a simple yoga and meditation class, which was founded by Shoko Asahara, using his bizarre interpretations of various forms of Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, yoga, and the works of Nostradamus. In 1992, Shoko published a book that claimed that he was not only Christ, but Japan's only enlightened master. He claimed that he had the ability to take away the sins and bad deeds of his followers and transfer spiritual power to them. As is the case in a lot of cults, he claimed that doomsday was fast approaching and that everyone except his followers would be the movement grew, eventually getting enough members to be considered an official religion. Membership continued to grow, but rumblings began emerging that some members were being tricked into joining, were being forced to donate large sums of money, being held against their will, and in one case even murdered when they tried to leave. An anti-cult lawyer tried to sue the group and soon went missing with his wife and child. Things escalated even further in 1993 when the group tried to use a machine to pump anthrax onto a neighborhood in Tokyo, although thankfully the group had stolen the wrong type of anthrax and no one was hurt. Due to the failure of the anthrax, the group began manufacturing sarin and VX nerve gas, which they used in their subsequent attacks. In 1994, the group used a converted refrigerator truck to release the gas on a neighborhood where judges, who were presiding over a lawsuit against the group, lived. 500 people were injured and 8 died, but the attack was not linked to the cult at the time. 
A few months later, the brother of a member who had escaped was kidnapped, dispatched by the group, and disposed of with a microwave-powered incinerator. He had left a note saying that should he go missing, the group was responsible. Azahara was trying to manufacture weapons, and in order to distract the police, had some of his followers carry out a devastating attack. On March 20th, 1995, Ohm members boarded five separate trains in Tokyo subway system and released sarin gas, resulting in 13 people dying, 54 being seriously injured, and between 900 80 and 6,000 people being hurt. This distraction backfired and the police raided the group's base at the foot of Mount Fuji and discovered explosives, weapons, biological warfare agents, and even a Russian military helicopter. Over 150 cult members were arrested. The next month, a burning paper bag containing a hydrogen cyanide device was found and diffused. Had it not been found in time, over 10,000 people could have died. Several other similar devices were found in the days following, and more disasters were averted. Azahara was a eventually arrested as his cult continued to attack people connected with the investigation, sending bombs in the mail to the governor, resulting in his secretary's fingers being blown off. In October of 1995, the group was stripped of its religious status and went bankrupt, but it managed to rebrand and still operates in a limited capacity to this day. Azahara and the 12 other cult members who had been found responsible for the attacks were arrested and held until their executions in 2018. Number 3. Heaven's Gate Not to be confused with the 1980 western that flopped so hard that the director-driven film era in Hollywood was brought to an end, Heaven's Gate was an American religious movement founded in 1974 by Bonnie Nettles in Marshall Applewhitam, otherwise known as T and Doe. T met Doe while working at a hospital in 1972 when Doe was visiting a sick friend. Doe was really into biblical prophecy and upon meeting the woman, felt that she was so familiar that they must have met in a past life. On the other hand, she claimed that aliens had told her that they would one day meet and that they had a divine mission to accomplish. You know, just like the Blues Brothers. The two studied religious and science fiction texts together, eventually coming to the logical conclusion that Doe was a reincarnated Jesus and that they had been chosen to fulfill the prophecies of the Bible and that they had been given higher level minds than most folks, and were the two witnesses described in the book of Revelations. They were pretty sure that they would die and be resurrected, at which point a UFO would show up and take them away. They had trouble getting followers until they began advertising meetings where they claimed that aliens wanted volunteers for an experiment, which would result in the subjects being brought to a higher evolutionary level. They recruited over 100 members who they traveled the country with before becoming reclusive. Bonnie Nettles, aka T, died of liver cancer in 1985, and Marshall Applewhite, aka Doe, became the sole leader of the group. In 1996, the group rented a home in Rancho Santa Fe in California, which they referred to as the Monastery. In 1997, Doe made a video message claiming that they had to evacuate Earth by taking their own lives as Heaven's Gate was closing, and by dying, they would be taken by a UFO to a higher level of existence. Doe and 38 other cult members then dressed in identical black shirts with armbands that read Heaven's Gate Away Team as an extremely macabre Star Trek reference. All of them were also wearing Nike Decades, as the group apparently had adopted the company's slogan of Just Do It as a personal slogan. The group then covered their heads with plastic bags and asphyxiated. They did this in three tiers so that the remaining members could take off their bags and arrange their bodies with dignity. In an interesting bit of trivia, in the aftermath of this incident, the Nike decades have become a highly sought after collector's item due to their involvement in the incident, because of course they are. Number two, the People's Temple Agricultural Project. Founded by Jim Jones in Indiana in 1955, the People's Temple preached that those who remained drugged with the opiate of religion had to be brought to enlightenment with socialism. Of course, this wasn't the fun Bernie Sanders socialism where everyone gets to go to college. Jordan's main influences were people like Chairman Mao and Joseph Stalin. He was driven out of Indiana due to having integrationist beliefs and went to California where he became involved in local politics, helping George Moscone become mayor of San Francisco in 1975. As a result, Jones was made the chairman of the city's Housing Authority Commission, which allowed him to rub elbows with the wealthy and powerful. After some backlash from local newspapers and fears of a police crackdown, the group set up a commune in Guyana, which was a small and poor enough and independent enough country that Jones thought he would be able to easily get political influence and protection. With the approval of the local government, the group began building their commune, which they called Jonestown. He made a deal with the government that would allow hundreds of cult members to enter the country, but very difficult for them to leave. At its peak, Jonestown had about 900 people living in the small commune. Jones became more and more unhinged, controlling the media the group were allowed to consume, lest they be subjected to a movie that wasn't pro-Marxist. He made everyone in the commune work long shifts six days a week. 
He continued to brainwash and manipulate his people, telling them that they would soon be under attack by the CIA and should prepare to eventually take their own lives as a form of revolutionary protest, and had them guard the entrances of Jonestown with machine guns and machetes. As concerns from family members in the states grew, investigations into Jonestown began. When a delegation of investigators, reporters, and concerned relatives went to visit the commune, they were able to convince a few members to defect. As they tried to return to the states on two planes, one of the defectors produced a handgun and began opening fire on the other passengers. At the same time, a tractor trailer stormed the airstrip, with the passengers of the trailer producing shotguns and firing at the planes, with none on board surviving. While this was happening, Jones had a cocktail of poisons mixed into a large tub of grape flavor aid, and had the 909 residents drink it and take their own lives. Despite the fact that it was flavor aid that was used by Jones, the incident was the source of the expression, drink the Kool Aid. Number one, the Thuggy Cult. The Thuggy were a secret society operating in India in the mid 1800s who were known for attacking travelers and garroting them with a weapon called a rumal. Its members were trained from childhood in its use. They considered efficient and quiet acts of murder to be the greatest accomplishment possible. They would follow groups of travelers until they made camp, at which point they would attack. Word of the Thuggy began to grow as numerous bodies began to be discovered in wells around the countryside. However, the Thuggy were not attacking their victims simply to take their valuables. The number one rule of the cult was not to shed any of their victims' blood, as they were actually human sacrifices for their god, Kali. The Thuggy believed that constant indulgence in vices was the only way to become closer to and achieve union with their god. During the time that the cult was active, over 30,000 people were attacked by the Thuggy and sacrificed to Kali. British officers were tasked with eliminating the cult and began mapping out the cult's attacks in order to predict where the attacks would likely take place and set traps for the thuggy while disguised as merchants and travelers. Between 1830 and 1841, at least 3,700 cult members were captured, effectively ending the group. Many were put in prison for the rest of their lives, with 500 of them being hanged. Without exception, all of them that went to the gallows showed no emotion or remorse, often requesting to put on their own nooses themselves. When asked if he was sorry, one member who claimed to have the thuggy record for most victims at 931 responded that no one should ever feel bad for following their trade. The term thug is still used to this day to describe a brutal criminal, and the group is remembered for their various appearances as villains in films over the years, such as when they were depicted by Steven Spielberg in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Number five, Kali Meteor. Thousands of years ago, a meteor hit Estonia with the force of a Hiroshima bomb. The meteor fragmented, creating nine craters, which are now called the Kali Crater Field. One of these craters was over 100 meters and became a site of holy worship for some of the locals. Surrounding the water-filled crater is a large stone wall from the Late Bronze Age, and the wall is stronger than any of the other similar structures in the surrounding area that were made at the time, hinting to scientists and historians the importance of the building. A large concentrated amount of animal remains were found at the Kali Crater and led anthropologists to believe that they were used as ritualistic sacrifices. The thing is, the bones were found thousands of years after the wall was built, meaning the crater was a consistent site of worship for thousands of years. There are several legends surrounding the lake, especially in Finnish mythology. Here's a quick synopsis. Quote, Louis, the evil wizard, steals the sun and fire from people, causing total darkness. Ukko, the god of the sky, orders a new sun to be made from a spark. The virgin of the air starts to make a new sun, but the spark drops from the sky and hits the ground. The spark goes to an Aluen, or Kalevan Lake and causes its water to rise. Finnish heroes see the ball of fire falling somewhere behind the Neva River. The heroes head in that direction to seek fire, and they finally gather flames from a forest fire." End quote. The legend mentions a spark of sun, referring to the meteor, which when landed causes a huge impact and a forest fire. I mean, it's like dropping an actual bomb. The impact was insane. The crater has no noted reports of being an active worship site as of today, but such a widespread belief must have been passed down. I highly doubt the beliefs would have just ended there. Number four, the Pythagoreans. Pythagoreanism originated in 600 BC, based on the beliefs and teachings that Pythagoras and his followers held. Pythagoras established the first Pythagorean community in the ancient Greek colony of Croton. The beliefs spread quickly throughout the land, and the death of Pythagoras created even more popularity as people created their own traditions within the belief system. The beliefs influenced Plato, and through him, they influenced Western philosophy. Most of the surviving information on Pythagoras came from Aristotle and the philosophers of the Peripatetic School. The beliefs spread widely, and some say that they have survived as part of the Bashic cults and Orphism. The beliefs included science and religion. Pythagoras was very well known in ancient times for his mathematical achievement. The Pythagorean 
Turing theorem. I wish he wasn't as well known because I hated that class. He was also noted for his discovery that music had mathematic foundations. He's been credited as the philosopher who first discovered music intervals and is said to have invented the monochord. As I said, a lot of the information we now have on Pythagoras came from Aristotle and the Peripatetic school. The 5th century BCE information do not have any elements of supernatural entities, but by 4th century BCE, legends and fables were introduced into the belief system. Pythagoras founded the first community in Croton during 5th century BCE. He described it as a secret society and he also gained political influence. The military and economy in Croton soon became very strong. In the early years, the Pythagorean sects were closed societies, where new members were chosen by existing ones, based on intelligence and discipline. Then they went under a five-year initiation period where they would listen to teachings in complete silence. Then they would complete a test and if they passed, they would be welcomed to the inner circle. But they were able to leave whenever they wanted. Soon it became customary for family members to become Pythagoreans, as it developed into a philosophical tradition that influenced everyday life and swore members to secrecy. Within his teachings, Pythagoras emphasized moderation, vegetarianism, respect for elders, and the state, and believed in a monogamous family structure. Boring. They believed the soul of humans was buried in the body, and the highest reward a human could attain was the soul joining the gods, meaning that they escaped reincarnation. They believed the soul was buried in the body as punishment, but that the soul could be purified. So they did a lot of soul cleansing rituals. The list of beliefs honestly go on and on. They include things like harmony, music, geometry, arithmetic, numbers, and cosmology. The disputes regarding Pythagoras' teachings began shortly after his death, which was caused by an arson attack. The disagreements led to two separate Pythagorean traditions, Akousmatikoi and Mathematikoi. The Mathematikoi recognized the religious undertones of Pythagoreanism and studied it as part of their practice, but they focused more on the science and research part of Pythagoreanism. Their scientific pursuits were largely mathematical, but they did also conduct research in fields that Pythagoras had in his lifetime. The Akousmatikoi believed humans had to act in inappropriate ways. They refused to recognize the advancements that the Mathematikoi were making in mathematical and scientific research, which were, as I said, in line with Pythagoras' beliefs. They also challenged his original teachings, including harmony, justice, ritual purity, and morals. The tension between the two groups only grew as their individual beliefs grew further and further apart over the years. Number three, the snake cult of Glycon. Glycon was an ancient snake god who had a large and influential cult in the Roman Empire during the second century. The cult is thought to have originated in Macedonia, where other snake cults much like Glycon had existed for centuries. Macedonians believed snakes had magical powers in fertility. Initially, the cult did not worship the spirit of the snake or an abstract idea of a godly snake. Instead, they worshiped an actual physically tangible snake that resembled the god. The creator of this cult, Alexander, foretold that there would be a reincarnation of Asclepius. It's said that Alexander procured an egg, and when the people gathered to see it hatch, Alexander cut the goose egg open and revealed the prophetic snake god inside. The small snake grew to the size of a man with the features of a human on its face, including long blonde hair. Some say that the figure depicted at this stage was actually just a puppet or a trained snake with a puppet head creepy. The focus of worship in the cult was fertility. Barren women would bring offerings to Glycon in the hopes of becoming pregnant. By 160 AD, the cult's teachings and methods began to spread. An inscription from that era reads, Glycon protect us from the plague cold. The same year, the government of Asia declared that he was the protector of Glycon's oracle. The governor also married Alexander's daughter. Many sought prophecies from Alexander, yearning to learn of what their future holds and even how they might perish. The cult's beliefs were spread through lower social classes and over time even high class citizens and officials were die hard believers of Glycon's healing and of the prophecies Alexander told. The support and belief of the emperors paired with the healing powers of serpents throughout history lured many people into the cult. There was no shortage of converts and believers. Roman coins were even made in honor of Glycon, which likely happened way after Alexander's lifetime. For at least a hundred years after Alexander's passing, a new Glycon cult formed and began to spread their influence. Statues and 
other archaeological finds have been located in Tomi, now known as Constata, displaying just how present the cult was throughout history in the large city. The Glycon cult is still referred to, to this day. The statue that was found in Constata, Romania is on display at the Constata History and Archaeology Museum. The statue is even commemorated on a postage stamp from 1974 and on a 10,000-lay banknote from 1994. And to this day, people declare themselves as devotees of Glycon. Talk about a long-lasting influence. Number two, the Elysian Mysteries. The Elysian Mysteries were initiations that were held every year for the cult of Demeter and Persephone. They took place at the Panhellenic Sanctuary of Ulysses in ancient Greece. They're considered the most famous of the secret ancient Greek religious sites. Their basis was an old agrarian cult, and there's evidence that they were derived from the religious practices of the Mycenaean period. The mysteries referred to Hades' abduction of Demeter's daughter, Persephone, and was told in three phases. Descent, search, and ascent. Originally, the cult of Demeter was private, hidden under the Telesterion. Some of the practices are seemingly influenced by other religious practices, specifically those from the Mycenaean period. The group would hold a feast. At the beginning, priests would fill two special vessels and then pour them out, one to the east and one to the west. Then, the people would look upwards and downwards while chanting, reign and conceive. Then, a child was initiated into the group from the divine fire. Honestly, I tried to decode this part for a while, but I had very little success, I'm sorry. The climax of the celebration represented the force of the new life. When the mysteries started, immortality was not a part of the beliefs, but as time went on, they believed that it would grant them a better fate in the underworld. Eventually, the mysteries were spread wide, and people from all over flocked to participate. Eventually, the mysteries were controlled by two families, which led to a huge number of initiates. The only requirements were that you had never directly caused someone's death and that you were able to speak Greek. Men, women, and slaves were all welcome. The mysteries came to an end around 170 AD, after it was ransacked by the Samaritans. Eventually, the building decayed and the religion died down, but it is still referred to often in art and literature, and many interesting theories regarding present-day mysteries have been mentioned. Number one, the cult of sacrifice. The cult of sacrifice is a pretty interesting one, and it actually differs a lot from the others because the cult did not worship any specific entity or object of power. The cult of sacrifice originated thousands of years ago, but its presence was not constant. It mainly occurred during great times of stress when it's believed and practices would be most useful. Records of the cult are poorly recalled and only exist in written form, so the origin's location is unknown, but it is speculated that it began in the eastern hemisphere of Rathnir because most written evidence was found there. As I mentioned earlier, the cult did not have an object or entity that they worshipped. Instead, they believed in sacrificing elements of their own life for the good of others. The cult was based on the idea of charity and self-sacrifice for the benefit of others, in particular, those who need it most. The cult took these ideals to an absolute extreme, though. They would starve and fast, not because it was a religious practice, but because they'd given all of their food to others who were perceived as having less. They were minimalists, not because they wanted to be, but because they would give all of their money and material possessions away to those who were perceived as having less. Essentially, they would damage themselves to the point of illness and death just in the name of sacrifice and in the hope of helping. This was most likely the reason that the cult had such sporadic activity throughout centuries because, you know, they were pretty extreme and a lot of people didn't survive. To join the cult, the only thing necessary was the blessing of an existing cult member, like any cult member. So yeah, it was able to spread through small communities pretty quickly. I'm kind of stuck on how strange the towns that this cult was prominent in probably looked. Like, I'm imagining people sleeping on the streets, freezing, overheating, and starving while there's just like a massive hoard of food that they've placed in the town center for the less fortunate. But like, no one will touch the food and all of their houses are empty because they're the only ones living there. Crazy. <laughs> the cult is essentially extinct because, you know, mostly everyone who is a member ended up dying from their loyal devotion. However, the cult came to its official end on August 8, 2021, when the last member died. The cult officially died because, if you remember, the only way to join the cult is to be blessed by an existing member. So, the faith is officially extinguished. I mean, their ideology is good, but extremism is never good. Middle ground, that's the sweet spot. Coming in at number five, Rosemary's baby.
Roman Polanski's masterpiece Rosemary's Baby set the standard for many cultist horror movies, particularly in the way it reveals the cult, using a steady and slow build and paranoia, confusing us as to what exactly is even happening. This 1968 horror stars Mia Farrow and chronicles the story of a pregnant woman who suspects that an evil cult wants to take her baby for use in their rituals. However, it is quickly revealed that her husband has made a deal with the devil for success in his acting career, and the price is offering up his wife as a surrogate mother for something truly evil. Satan's son. That's right, the cult uses Rosemary as a sacrificial lamb for Satan's grand return through his own offspring, and it is truly terrifying. The general sense of unease throughout the movie is why Rosemary's Baby is an absolute classic, and perhaps one of the scarier movies in the horror genre. The horrors depicted on and off the screen aided in the rumour that the film was actually cursed by the cult and summoned demons, with many incidents occurring off screen to the cast and crew, including the slaying of Roman Polanski's wife, Sharon Tate, at the hands of the Manson family. Coming in at number 4, VHS 2 Safe Haven. Safe Haven is one of four sections in the 2013 anthology found footage sequel VHS 2, with the segment being directed by Timo Tijanto and Gareth Hugh Evans and being the best section in the entirety of the movie. The plot follows a news crew composed of four members who infiltrate an Indonesian cult in the hopes of shooting a documentary about their mysterious activities. Inside the building, they find the walls adorned in bizarre symbols, school children in classrooms, and women dressed in white garments. One of the crew, Malik, then overhears that his fiancée, Lena, is pregnant with another crew member's child, Adam. Things then descend into total madness. The deeper the crew go inside the building, with Lena being abducted by several women, with the cult hunting down the crew members for sacrificial reasons. Now, with only 29 minutes to play with, Evans and Tajanto don't hold back, not even for a second, with the segment being insanely action packed and gore filled from start to finish. Not to mention, it builds to an insane, gore soaked climax that will shock the audience cult are successful in their demon summoning, with the beast making its grand appearance towards the final moments of the movie, and it does not disappoint. Coming in at number 3, we have Children of the Corn. Children in horror movies are already creepy, but put them in a cult, a cult composed solely of children, then you have a recipe for absolutely terrifying scares. Children of the Corn, based on the book of the same name by Stephen King, is a supernatural folk horror starring Linda Hamilton and Peter Haunton, and is set in a fictitious rural town of Gatlin, Nebraska. The film tells the story of a malevolent entity referred to as He Who Walks Behind the Rose, which entices the town's children to ritually murder all the town's adults and a couple driving across the country to ensure a successful corn harvest. As the couple arrive in the small, seemingly abandoned town, they discover the congregation of children led by a girl named Rachel, with them performing a cultural birthday ritual for Amos by drinking his blood from a pentagram-shaped cut on his body. Amos has turned 19, therefore is considered old enough for his passing, joining their god in the cornfield. Now, while the movie as a whole was a little disappointing, it does deliver on the horrors of cults. Not to mention there were seven sequels, with the first being far superior. The cult movie in turn gained a cult following, with it being a hit among movie lovers. Coming in at number two, we have Hereditary. One of two Ari Aster movies on our list, Hereditary was a surprise horror movie, with the reveal of its cult being kept a secret for much of the movie, making it incredibly unexpected when it begins to unfold. Released in 2018, Hereditary is Ari Aster's directorial debut, with it starring Tony Collette and Alex Wolfe as a family haunted by a mysterious presence after the death of their secretive grandmother. However, what begins as a sober family drama very quickly descends into a crazy supernatural horror. What begins as a slow burn quickly catapults into a disturbing horror after an incident involving the family's son and daughter, leaving viewers covering their mouths. As a result of the incident, the mother, Annie, is forced to turn to a support group member, Jones, for support, learning ways she can contact the realm of the supernatural. However, this has devastating consequences, with her awakening something that should never have been awoken. Viewers very quickly learn that a demon-worshipping cult are the true causes of 
the family's misery and pain. Worse still, Ariasta plants Easter eggs throughout the movie as a way of warning us of things to come. However, saying that, most of us may have missed these subliminal messages, but what I can say is, the wall-crawling demon was revealed long before the last 30 minutes of the movie, with the cult being there all along, watching the family and waiting for their moment. The cult in Hereditary are worshippers of Paimon, one of Lucifer's most obedient devotees, who rules 200 legions of angels, and is connected to the Tree of Death, hence why the treehouse in Hereditary is so important. The summoning of Paimon is gradual throughout the movie, but when he finally arrives and seeks solace in the body of one of the characters, well, it's enough to send shivers down anyone's spine. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Midsummer. There are a few things more terrifying than a cult in horror movies. A group of people devoted to a dark high power who will do absolutely anything to appease the deity. No movie displays this as effectively as Ari Aster's Midsommar. Released in 2019, Midsommar is a folk horror film starring my queen, Florence Pugh, and follows a group of friends who travel to Sweden for a festival that occurs once every 90 years, only to find themselves in the clutches of a pagan cult. Now, unlike Ari Aster's Hereditary, Midsommar lays out its intentions from the very start of the movie. The movie kicks off with Danny discovering the death of both her sister and parents, with the instant putting a strain on Danny's relationship with her already distant boyfriend Christian. Not long after, she learns that Christian has planned a trip to Sweden with his friends to attend a midsummer celebration at an ancestral commune, so the group packs up and heads out. Things very quickly descend into madness, with the group arriving and being met by a large group of white cult members in a very peculiar white outfit with Danny realizing that something isn't quite right here. However, her concerns are proven correct when two commune elders die by senicide by leaping from a clifftop. When the male elder survives the fall, the cult mimics his wails of agony and crushes his skull with a mallet. Yeah, things aren't fun in Sweden right now. Now, without ruining much more for those who haven't watched it yet, the cult does what is necessary to summon the dark higher power that they worship, with the American Taurus being used as a sacrifice for the demon. Now, more interesting still, while this movie isn't entirely based on a real cult, director Ari Aster does describe it as a stew of sorts. I quote, we're drawing from actual Swedish traditions. We're drawing from Swedish folklore, we're drawing from Norse mythology. All in all, Midsummer successfully draws on the disturbing conventions of cultist horror to generate a sense of dread and unease, making it my favourite folk horror movie and cult horror movie of all time. Number five, Scientology. I figured it was the easiest to kick off today, you know, with the most obvious cult, and personally for me, the scariest. Scientology is a set of beliefs and practices invented by the American author L. Ron Hubbard, who developed a series of ideas that he called Dianetics, which he represented as a form of of therapy. Okay, yeah, that's great therapy. An organization that he established in 1950 to promote it went bankrupt, and he lost the rights to his book in 1952. He then recharacterized his ideas as a religion for tax purposes and renamed them Scientology. By 1954, he had regained the rights to Dianetics and founded the Church of Scientology, which remains the largest organization promoting Scientology today. There are practitioners independent of the church in what is called the Free Zone, and estimates put the number of Scientologists at just under 40,000 people worldwide. So, you know, not a lot of people at all, just a small town. Scientology beliefs include reincarnation and that traumatic events cause problematic engrams in the mind. They claim that an activity called auditing can remove the bad engrams. A fee is charged though for each session of auditing. Once an auditor deems an individual free of engrams, typically after several years, they are given the status of cleared. After being deemed clear, adherents can take part in further activities called operating thetan levels, which require further payments. The operating thetan texts are kept secret for most followers and are revealed only after adherents have typically given hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Scientology organization. If you don't have ridiculous amounts of money to burn, don't worry, they're freely available online on sites such as WikiLeaks. And if you don't want to waste your time, these texts say past lives took place in extraterrestrial cultures. Look, I don't agree with Scientology, but I do agree with aliens visiting Earth. But these involve an alien called Xenu, described as a planetary ruler that existed 70 million years ago who brought billions of aliens to Earth and killed them with thermonuclear weapons. Yeah. I totally believe that. Despite being kept secret from most followers, this forms the central mythological framework of Scientology's crazy 
logic? Question mark. From soon after the formation, these groups have generated considerable opposition and controversy, in several instances because of their illegal activities. In 1967, Harvard established a new elite group, the Sea Organization or Sea Org, the membership of which was drawn from the most committed members of the church. By 1981, the 21-year-old David Miscavige, who had been one of you know his closest aides in the Sea Org, rose to prominence. Hubbard died at his ranch in Creston, California, on January 24th of 1986, and Miscavige succeeded Hubbard as the head of the church, a position he holds till this day. If you really want a mystery to solve, try and find David's wife. In 2013, actress Leah Remini, a former Scientologist and vocal critic of the organization, filed a missing persons report with the Los Angeles Police Department concerned about her disappearance. The LAPD allegedly contacted Shelley and closed the case within hours. Despite assurances from Church of Scientology spokespeople that Shelley Miscavige is alive and well, many continue to express skepticism. In 2022, after hearing about an investigation into now-retired LAPD Captain Corey Palka about alerting others of confidential police investigations, Remini revealed photographs of Palka accepting a $20,000 check from Scientology for LAPD charities in one of a Scientology information kiosk located in the LAPD Hollywood Division. While speaking with Palka in his office, Remini noticed a letter of thanks to him from Scientology with an invitation to lunch at their celebrity center. So bribery. As of 2023, Shelley Miscavige's whereabouts remain unknown, and who knows if we'll ever know. In the 1970s, Hubbard's followers engaged in a program of criminal infiltration of the U.S. government, resulting in several executives of the organization being convicted and imprisoned for multiple offenses by a U.S. federal court. Now, Hubbard himself was convicted in absentia of fraud by a French court in 1978 and sentenced to four years in prison. And in 1992, a court here in Canada convicted the Scientology organization in Toronto of spying on law enforcement and government agencies and criminal breach of trust, later upheld by the Ontario Court of Appeal. The Church of Scientology was convicted of fraud by a French court in 2009, a judgment upheld by the Supreme Court of Cassation in 2013. The Church of Scientology has been described by government inquiries, international parliamentary bodies, scholars, law lords, and numerous superior court judgments as both a dangerous cult and a manipulative profit-making business. I could talk about them for hours and just how awful they are, so let me know in the comments of that, so, you know, something y'all would be interested in. Number 3. The Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint, known as FLDS for short. Time to focus on the fundamentalist sects that uh, split off when the core religion opted to renounce the practice of polygamy. Technically speaking, polygamy is the practice or custom of having more than one wife or husband at the same time. And while I'm not judging multiple partners or open relationships when they're consensual or of age, there's a lot of ick to unpack here. It is estimated that 6,000 to 10,000 members reside within the congregate sister sites of Hilldale, Utah, Colorado City, Arizona, El Dorado, Texas, Westcliff, Colorado, Mancos, Colorado, Creston and Bountiful, British Columbia, and Pringle, South Dakota. Those who wish to continue the practice remained Mormon, but on their own terms. Polygamy remains, you know, illegal, and in 1953, an entire FLDS community was arrested in Short Creek, Arizona, otherwise known as modern-day Colorado City, and most had their little ones taken from them for safety. A compound in Texas was raided in 2008 after Child Protective Services was made aware of allegations of poor living situations. Over 400 younglings were taken from the compound and placed in CPS custody. So I remember hearing about the raid while watching the Oprah Winfrey show with my mom of all things. If my brain serves me right, it was about 10 months after the raid when all of the younglings were returned to the Yearning for Zion ranch, and it was such huge news that she was being granted access to this top secret compound. Leader of the FLDS Warren Jeffs remains in his position, you know, despite being in prison for life after acts against minors. Number 2. Aum Shinrikyo Founded by Shoko Asahara in 1984, Aum Shinrikyo is a Japanese new religious movement and doomsday cult who first made headlines in the late 80s amid accusations that Asahara was forcing members to donate money to the group and holding them against their will. Pardon me, I'll backtrack for a moment. Although Aum was, you know, from the beginning considered controversial in Japan, it was not initially associated with serious crimes. Aum's public relations activities included publishing comics and animated cartoons that attempted to tie its religious ideas to popular anime and manga themes, including space missions, powerful weapons, world conspiracies, and the quest for ultimate truth. Like many cult leaders, Azahar believed in an imminent doomsday. This time, it was caused by a world war started by the United States. And of course, you know, according to him, only his followers would survive 
alive. In 1991, Ahn began using wiretapping to get NTT uniforms and equipment and created a manual for wiretapping. In July of 1993, cult members sprayed large amounts of liquid containing Bacillus anthracis spores from a cooling tower on the roof of Am Shinrikyo's Tokyo headquarters. However, their plan to cause an anthrax epidemic failed. The attack resulted in a large number of complaints about bad odors, but no infections. Thank goodness. But by the end of 1993, the cult started secretly manufacturing the nerve agent Sarin and later VX. Om tested its Sarin on sheep at Banjo Warren Station, a remote pastoral property in Western Australia, killing 29 sheep. So both Sarin and VX were then used in several assassinations and attempts between 1994 to 95. In 1995, the group executed a Sarin gas attack in the Tokyo subway, which caused the deaths of 12 people and injured 50 more. The group says that those who carried out attacks did so secretly, without being known to other executives and ordinary believers. After that attack, Japanese authorities learned that the group had also been responsible for the death of lawyer Tsutsumi Sakamoto, who was working on a class action lawsuit against Aum Shinrikyo at the time of his death. Oh, uh, almost forgot, the group also killed his wife and descendant. Yes, independent people. On July 6 of 2018, after exhausting all appeals, Asahara and six followers on death row were executed as punishment for the 1995 attacks and other crimes. So I'm glad that unlike, you know, some of the other folks I've discussed today, some justice was actually served in this situation. Six additional followers were executed on the 26th of the same month, and at 12.10am on New Year's Day of 2019, at least nine people were injured when a car was deliberately driven into crowds celebrating the New Year on Takashita Street in Tokyo. Local police reported the arrest of Kazuhiro Kusakabe, the suspected driver, who allegedly admitted to intentionally ramming his vehicle into crowds to protest his opposition to the death penalty, specifically in retaliation for the execution of the uh, before mentioned Aum um, cult members. Number one, Good News International Church. The Good News International Ministries, GNIM for short, or Good News International Church, was founded by Paul McKenzie and his first wife in 2003. So this group attracted international attention in April of this year when it was revealed that McKenzie had allegedly instructed members to starve themselves to to meet Jesus before the end of the world, which has resulted in the deaths of over 400 people. And when you consider more than 600 people have been reported missing, it's just a yikes situation. About 65 rescued followers were charged with attempted self-ending of life after they refused to eat during their stay at a rescue center. The doomsday cult is adamantly anti-Western, and with amenities such as healthcare, education, and sports being dismissed as evils of Western life, and with Mackenzie condemning the United States, the United Nations, and the Catholic Church as tools of Satan. Look, I'm all for condemning the Catholic Church, but call Calling it a tool of Satan feels like an oxymoron. The group devotes much of its teachings to the end times, ergo I've been dubbed a doomsday cult. The definition of which is a cult that believes in apocalyptism and millennialism including both these, you know, that predict disasters and those that attempt to destroy the entire universe. Mackenzie founded the GNIM in 2003 and accumulated a sizable following, largely due to convincing his followers that he could speak directly with God. Beginning in the late 2010s, Mackenzie's church began to receive a renewed wave of scrutiny regarding the internal practices of the organization, particularly in 2017 when Mackenzie and his wife faced several charges relating to the church. He was chastised for inciting students to abandon their education after denouncing it as ungodly, as well as radicalizing and denying medical care to them afterwards. Several students died as a result, and in 2017, 93 students were rescued by government authorities from the group. After another arrest in 2019, he departed Malindi and headed to the Shakahola Forest, where the mass starvation occurred earlier this year. Now, Mackenzie did not join his followers in the mass starvation. In fact, a dietary menu was found on the wall in one of the special houses in the forest, believed to be his resting room. He's currently under police custody as the process of exhuming the bodies continues. Police authorities claim that some bodies were missing organs, and believed they were being harvested and sold. Number five, the Skull and Bone Society. Now, I'm gonna be honest, this video might be the one to get the channel taken down. I've made a lot of bold videos. I've made some very, very heretical claims against the Catholic Church, and I've said some wild things and claimed them as facts regarding the Megalodon, but this might be the video to get the channel blacklisted as we start diving into and talking about some of the most secretive societies out there. The Skull and Bone Society is one of the more well-known secret societies, and yeah, I guess that's kind of an oxymoron. It's an undergraduate society at Yale University. Founded in 1832, it's renowned the world over for just how darn secretive it is, and its practice of strange rituals and its secret membership. Partly why it's so captivating to conspiracy theorists is its alumni are something to boast about. Many presidents have been members of the Skull and Bones Society, both Bush Sr. and Jr. Speculation runs rampant when it comes to the Skull and Bones. So 
suggesting that powerful elites from within influence politics and finance. Now, membership, as one could expect, is very limited to a select few senior students at Yale who are chosen through mysterious ways, okay? You need to work on a lot more than just your GPA. I don't even know how to get in or, or what the criteria is, but it's not just anybody. These initiates are referred to as bonesmen. The society's rituals are kept to the utmost secrecy, even after their time in the society. After you leave, you can't go around telling everybody about the Skull and Bones Society and all the stuff you got up to, and clearly no one's doing that because it was not easy to find information for this. Some suggest the society acts as a breeding ground for future leaders, wielding significant power in business, politics, and finance, while others believe they're part of a larger cabal of conspiracies with hidden agendas tied to the Masons and the Illuminati. Now, there is precious little information regarding the Skull and Bones out there. We know it exists. That much is true. And many powerful people have claimed or have been claimed to be the members. But as far as actual cold hard facts about what happens behind closed doors, we don't know a lot. I am but a humble YouTuber. I never went to Yale. Uh, if anyone wants to extend me an invite, I think the top five scary DMs are open. But for now, we know precious little about the infamous secret society. Now we may not know a lot about the skull and bones, but we have lots of other secrets for you to unveil from everything from Bigfoots, ghosts, conspiracies, ghouls, goblins, pretty much anything scary or freaky under the sun or above it, we've got a video or two on. So hit subscribe to Top 5 Scary. Please ring that little, little bitty little bell so you don't miss a video. But do that at the end of this video so I can tell you about all these other secret societies, okay? Number four, Freemasonry. Our next entry is the Freemasons, a group I am sure you've probably heard of before. The Freemasons are a fraternal organization that traces its origins back to the medieval guild of stonemasons. Makes sense. Now, while its early history is rooted in the craft of stone masonry, or blue collar work, the modern day Freemasons have evolved into a global fraternity that promotes brotherhood, personal development, philanthropy, and if you believe the stories, might secretly be running the world from behind the shadows. Freemasons Masonry has long been associated with conspiracies, definitely because of its secretive nature, its symbols, and its historical prominence. The group actually does have slight ties to the founding of the Illuminati, with the group's order serving as inspiration for Adam Weishaupt's group, which we will talk about more about at the end of the video. Freemasons are sometimes spoken of like a synonym for the Illuminati, like they're interchangeable groups, with the belief that Freemasons are involved in clandestine activity. To the theorists, Freemasons control governments, banks, using their influence and pointing out that throughout history, many notable world leaders and key figures have been Freemasons or have had familial ties to Freemasonry. And there are some wilder conspiracy theories out there too that suggest that Freemasonry is tied to supernatural or occult practices, claiming that Freemasons engage in esoteric rituals and possess hidden knowledge, ancient mysteries, secret teachings. Uh, these beliefs make Freemasonry out to be a, a real secrety, secret kind of cult organization. Now, Freemasonry is real. Nobody's doubting that, nobody's disproving that. The chances are actually pretty good that there's probably a Freemason Lodge very close to where you live. The Freemasons boast brotherhood, fraternity, philanthropy, personal development, and they've got all these lovely things on their website, and I'm more than inclined to agree it really is just a place to hang out and rub elbows with other people, or is that all just a very convenient cover story to cover over the truth? Number three, the Knights Templar. Now, perhaps you know this next group best as the villains of the Assassin's Creed, franchise, or depending on your personal philosophies, the unspoken hero of the Assassin's Creed franchise, but that's another story. The Knights Templar were a medieval Christian military order formed in the 12th century to protect the pilgrims that were traveling to Jerusalem during the Crusades. Very, very quickly, the Templars grew in power, wealth, and influence, and this band of swordsmen quickly rose to establish a network all across Europe. Now. There have been a ton of conspiracies revolving around the Knights Templars over the years. I'm sure partly because the Knights Templars is a very cool sounding name. They also had a sudden and dramatic downfall. Didn't have anything to do with any order of hay jumping assassins, but they did close their gates pretty quickly. In 1307, King Philip IV of France initiated a campaign against the Templars, accusing them of many heinous crimes, heresies, idolatry, corruption, secret ceremonies. Now the order was officially disbanded after this, and many of its members were arrested, interrogated, and executed. And quick aside, the Templars really did do a lot of these things, and the Templars did unspeakable things 
during the Crusades, and it's not that far to say the Templars were a very, very, very malignant presence. One prominent conspiracy theory suggests that the Templars possessed hidden knowledges or relics, including the Holy Grail or Ark of the Covenant, believing these sacred artifacts bestowed them incredible power and influence. Some people also theorize that the Templars knew they were going to be disbanded, and they concealed these treasures to pass them on to other secret societies. This shows up very, very prominently in Assassin's Creed, where the Templar Order sort of splinters off into all these different little groups, but holds on to these pieces of Eden, these powerful relics that give them all these powers, but I gotta stop talking about Assassin's Creed. Another theory links the Templars to Freemasonry, suggesting that the Order's traditions, symbolism, and rituals were passed down and sort of given to the Freemasons. Which is why the Freemasons, the Knights Templar, and the Illuminati are so connected in conspiracy circles. Some conspiracists propose that the Templars survived their dissolution and the disbandment was just a cover story and they're still operating their clinking swords together having secret meetings. They went underground, established new organizations, and now they're rebranding themselves. Some claiming that they played a role in shaping historical events such as the American Revolution or founding these modern banking systems and eventually sort of snake their way into every other general controlling the world conspiracy theory. Yeah, big ol' pause. Number two, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Wow. Coming up next is going to be the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which was a mystical 19th century order emerging in England and one of the best names for a secret society like ever. This sounds like the villains of a Final Fantasy game. The order was famous for its esoteric tradition and practice of magic. Yep, the order that sounds like it's a bunch of wizards did practice magic. The Golden Dawn sought to explore the spiritual and occult aspects of the world through their rituals and symbolism. Now, the order was founded by three key individuals. That's William Woodman, William Westcott, and Samuel Little McGregor Mathers, who secretly resented the other two members for having alliterative W names and he felt deeply left out. Over the years, the Golden Dawn would attract plenty of notable figures, including notorious occultist Aleister Crowley, who did also inspire one of the best Black Sabbath songs. Internally, the Golden Dawn experienced a manner of conflict. Disagreement over leaderships, initiation, and the true nature of the Order's teachings and mission were all things that caused strife. Some people later on have suggested these internal conflicts were planned to maintain control and secrecy over the organization. Imagine that. Your organization is so secret, you need to get rid of your own members. Keep them out of the loop. They know too much. Conspiracists believe that the Order's supernatural ties mean they are involved with some paranormal entities. Maybe we're getting a little bit out there. Believing that they were able to manipulate and control individuals and situations. They could control minds and influence. Summon demons. Of course, it could also just be a giant load of hullabaloo and the Golden Dawn could have been nothing more than a bunch of old men role-playing wizards like a Dungeons and Dragons club. We'll probably never know the truth though. At number one, we got the Illuminati proper. They had to be the number one secret society, right? Who else could it have been? Is there a more famous secret society? There's probably more secret societies, but I wouldn't know about them. You certainly know the Illuminati as this shadowy organization of puppet masters pulling the strings and influencing the world behind their scenes, using Jay-Z and Beyonce to further their goals somehow. But what do you know of the group's origins? to separate the fact through the fiction. Let me take you on a journey after a few minutes of Google searching. The infamously secretive order's origins can actually be traced back kinda easy to a university professor named Adam Weishaupt in 1776. He taught natural law at a university in Bavaria and was orphaned at an early age. He was then raised by his erudite uncle who fostered a love of knowledge in the boy. Adam loved knowledge and thought that consuming knowledge was life's greatest pursuit. He was very frustrated by countries and states that were dominant by religion, like his Catholic homeland of Bavaria. He was very anti-Catholic church, a position that was not particularly looked upon with favor at the time. Now, Adam had envisioned a tight group of people who could challenge the church's stranglehold on information, and he saw a formal group in mind focused on illumination rather than suppression. There is definitely some irony in a group that's so famous now for secrecy and mystery that its original intention was to illuminate people. Initially, Weishaupt sought out the Order of Freemasons, believing that the Freemasons were exactly the men he was looking for. But he was denied entry. Frustrated, Adam chose to seek out his own people and dubbed his new group the Order of the Illuminati, but based his organization very strongly on the Freemasons. He borrowed their hierarchy, code names, clandestine dealings, a lot of their symbolism. And this 
is largely why people sort of mistake the two groups and correlate them together, lump them in with the same conspiracies. Adam did also pluck several Freemasons from lodges to come join, so undoubtedly there was crossover between both groups, but they're different things. Since then, pretty much every single conspiracy theory imaginable has been connected to the Illuminati. Governments, banks, entertainment, bada 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 bada. It's all orchestrated by the Illuminati and we simply play out their script. Symbols such as the Eye of Providence are seen as proof. You know, it's on the dollar bill or there's symbology used in music videos and entertainment. That's proof of the group's control. Anytime you see Jay-Z doing one of these, that's proof that he's an Illuminati agent. So there was a real Illuminati, definitely, and there were a bunch of Bavarian nerds, but is there still an Illuminati pulling all the strings? 